That's kind of what best practices are. It's what's best in general, right? That's not the goal to find what works best in general. The goal is to find what works best for you. And it's really hard to do that unless you... Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Being Yourself show, where world's renowned thought leaders, best-selling authors, and entrepreneurs share their wisdom and insight with you so that you can achieve your goals and be more productive, more fulfilled, and be a better version of yourself. If you're new here, then do consider subscribing for your weekly dose of knowledge, inspiration, and motivation. This episode is being recorded in association with Let's Localize, an organization with a mission to foster micro-contributions from communities and businesses to support schools for their need of time, skill, and money. To know more about Let's Localize, click on the card above or the link in description below. I'm your host Ajay Mathur and my guest today is Jay Akunzo, who is an author, entrepreneur and a globally sought after speaker. He's a content creator who started in print media. I worked with ESPN and then he moved into digital media uh, as a digital media strategist with Google. He's known as an evangelist for breaking away from conventional wisdom. Jay is a founder and creator of award-winning podcast Unthinkable, which he grew from a single podcast to a media empire within one year. His work and his thought leadership has been featured in many media outlets such as Washington Post, Fast Company, Forbes, New York Times, just to name a few. His recent book, Break the Wheel, which looks like this. The book has been critically acclaimed as a complete paradigm shift. The book helps you to bridge the gap between being average and being exceptional. Jay, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. That is a, is a very kind introduction. I appreciate it. Thank you. Jay, I wanted to know, I read about you, you worked in Google at Digital Media Strategist and, and whatnot, yeah, ESPN, and you had some journalism career also. First of all, why did you leave Google? I mean, Google's job is like one of the most lucrative people would like to work with Google. Why did you leave Google? Yeah, I thought I was one of those students, by the way, where I thought that was making it in one's career, right? So I was a, an, a, an A student, you know, the thought of getting a B on a test or not succeeding in school was frightening to me. So I worked hard in school, get the good grades, join the clubs, join the teams, become the president of the club, become the captain of the team. You know, you, you go to good schools, you graduate, you get a job at Google, you've made it, you've succeeded. That's what success means. And at Google, what I was doing was just not creative. I'd wanted to be a writer in school. In fact, I wanted to be a sports writer uh, specifically. And getting the job at Google, you know, it was hard to pass up. I got very lucky. They wanted to interview me. Of, of course, I'll accept this job. It's Google. This is 2008. So it was before a lot of tech startups were a lot more glamorous, uh, maybe than some giant company like Google. So Google seemed like it was it. And I was profoundly unhappy. I was working in sales, uh, selling advertising, and my brain was not prepared for that because I thought this is it. I've, I've made it. I'm supposed to be happy. Why am I not fulfilled? This is what the story that was handed to me in this nice, neat box labeled career that was the culmination of the story. Why was I not, un, uh, why was I not happy? And don't get me wrong, I'm grateful. I, I met my wife the first day of the job, so I can't complain too much about the job, but it wasn't the right job for me. And you mentioned the book, Break the Wheel. And so much of what I've realized looking back was I was trying to live out what the general idea of success was, but what the actual fulfilling role that I needed to have in that stage of my career or, or what the types of jobs I wanted to actually do looked like were different for me in my specific situation. And I just was not trained to make choices based on my specific aspirations or the variables in my world. I was trained that there is a general path or a best practice, if you will, for one's career. I followed it to the letter and I was still unhappy. So that threw me completely. And I had to figure out why. Um, and years later, I ended up writing the book that I think in some small way was inspired by that moment or that job. Another tipping point for me was having worked for Google, worked for small companies no one ever heard of, liking those companies better, liking those jobs better because they were more creative, because I valued control over certainty as a maker of things, as an entrepreneur, um, building a career and designing it and, and learning to be more kind of self-aware about what is best for me, not what's best in general. It's kind of what best practices are. It's what's best in general, right? That's not the goal to find what works best in general. The goal is to find what works best for you. And it's really hard to do that unless you take your lumps a little bit and get frustrated. And I was frustrated in a lot of jobs that the brand seemed kind of cool. Uh, the job was just not for me. And about 2016, I started a podcast called Unthinkable. 
and I just started telling stories. I was just trying to learn the medium of telling stories through audio and crafting it like some of my hero stories. You know, my, my favorite storyteller of all time is Anthony Bourdain, how he did his travel show on TV. I wanted to do an audio version and talk not about food and culture, but about creativity and creative careers. And uh, two and a half years of making that show, I realized that every single person I talked to had one thing in common. They had questioned the conventional thinking, did something that seemed radical or unthinkable, per the name of the show, from the outside looking in, if all you know is the best practice, but then you talk to them and every single person described what they did that was innovative or creative or visionary. They would describe what they did as somehow very strategic and obvious to them. And it was like, why is that the case? You know, it seems like they're so innovative or unthinkable or even radical, but they were just following their intuition or following the variables in their unique firsthand situation that we lacked if all we knew was the best practice of their space. So that showed me story after story that there, there was something in here that maybe we should get better at questioning best practices and vetting all of these possibilities people hand us as rules and actually making decisions based on our own unique situations the way I did not when I was at Google. Did you not just say that from outside, it still looks like they are following best practices, but they are not? Just the opposite. From the outside looking in, it looks like they did something radical. Or as the name of the, my show, Unthinkable, implies, it looks okay. like they were unthinkable in their choices. Mm. How could you do it that way? I'll give you an example. There's a coffee company in the United States called Death Wish Coffee. It's the world's strongest coffee. It's like two and a half times the average cup of coffee in caffeine content. Mm -hmm. And for years, this entrepreneur, Mike Brown, was running a coffee shop that was struggling in New York. And uh, one day, a truck driver walked into his shop and asked him for a stronger cup of coffee. And you know, Mike poured him whatever he had on hand, and, and the guy left. And he thought to himself that he kept hearing that question, stronger coffee, stronger coffee, stronger coffee. Why? Well, the more Mike dug into it, the more he realized that what these people wanted was not a stronger cup of coffee, but it was like the transaction, the ability to go chase your life with a passion. That's really what they were doing. The truck driver, the entrepreneur, the artist walking in, they didn't sip their coffee sitting down next to some exposed brick like I do as a writer. These people were like, I want to inject caffeine into my veins and go chase the life I wanna build or go do something that seems hard. And so Mike started tinkering on this idea of the world's strongest coffee and he used this type of coffee bean that most people in the coffee industry frown upon called Robusta coffee. Well, Robusta coffee is among the more bitter types of coffee, but it's also among the more potent types of coffee. So in general, don't roast Robusta coffee. But if you think what you're doing is for this group of people who just want the transactional nature of coffee, almost like a Red Bull or a five-hour energy, but in a coffee cup, use Robusta beans. Because what they're actually after is not this artisanal experience. What they're actually after is the energy, is the motivation is what happens after you finish your coffee, which is you get to chase your dreams or live your life hard, right? So in general, you would do one thing, the best practice, it's a bean called Arabica. In the specific, in Mike's unique context, he had dug up at least one variable, and there's more that I uncovered in my research in the book, but one variable that was unique to him that he used to inform a decision that to the generalists or the experts seems unthinkable, but it wasn't for him. And you go deep into this because he started asking then, why do you like strong coffee, right? And then they said, okay, so that they can work longer. And then they, he asked another question and another question and another question. So eventually right. he was actually trying to understand the motivation of the customers, right? why, why they would like to have that product, isn't it? Correct. He, he reasoned from first principles. You know, it's, it's easy to say, what do you want? Strong coffee, here's strong coffee. Well, why do you want strong coffee? And everyone assumes they know. Well, of course they want more caffeine. Of course, they want more energy. That's what caffeine is for. Actually, why they want more energy is because they want to work themselves to death. They want to pursue the life they want to live before they die. They want to leave the world better before they leave it for good. All of these things, that, that was why they wanted coffee. And that's why people today really love Death Wish Coffee. Mike turned his business around. He doesn't just run a coffee shop anymore. He sold the shop. He runs an e-commerce business. And they're thriving um, even through the pandemic. You know, e-commerce obviously being a category that, that did. And so that's the, the way I think to make better decisions is to look for first principles in your own unique situation. So whether you call this self-awareness or situational awareness, I think the way you sum this up is we're taught to try and be the expert. I actually think it's far better if you're the explorer. And the difference is instead of trying to have all the answers to act, you act to find your answers. You ask better questions. 
instead of look for someone else's supposedly right answers. Mm. So, if it, so you can say that there is nothing intrinsically wrong with best practices because they kind of generalizing something at a very high level. But if you go deep into your particular requirements and keep asking questions to drill it down, then you can have kind of best of both worlds. Like you can use the best practices, but you add your experience to it to make it a best practice for you. Exactly. I think of this as contextualized decision making, hmm. almost like setting up a filter. And that filter, the shape of it is like the shape of your own unique situation with all kinds of variables. But in the book, I tried to distill it down to, to three core variables to investigate uh, in the workplace. This is you know, a book for people's careers and businesses. There's you, the person or people doing the work. There's your audience, the person or people the work is for. And then there's your resources, which is your means to make the work happen. Mm -hmm. And if you can just investigate those three things a little bit more specifically and focus on understanding them, then this decision-making filter is like, you know, the visual would be grab a best practice or your own unique idea and try to shove it through the filter. Now, if you take a best practice that everybody is thinking about or practicing, sometimes it'll get through the filter because in your situation, the best practice makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Sometimes none of it gets through, sometimes a piece of it. And what, we're, what we lack in this age of information overload or advice overload is the way to vet best practices. So in the industry I came up in marketing, everyone's like, what's the best practice? You got to be on Clubhouse. Here's how to use Clubhouse. Here's how to do this. Here's how to do that. You get shooted to death. You should do this. You should do it this way, right? Because we're not equipped to say, actually, in my situation, only a part of that makes sense or none of that makes sense. Or yes, thank you for the advice. It totally makes sense. So the skill here is not rejecting best practices. It's learning how to see them as they really are, mm. which is not rules. They're just possibilities. And then learning how to vet those possibilities because the goal is not to find best practices it's to find the best approach for you exactly how would you stop yourself from not being influenced by best practices when when you probably don't have that much of experience so somebody who is new they will follow the rule book right and that's what right. we have been educated you read the book this is the question this is the answer right and we work based on that kind of mentality right when somebody is trying to break through in something good that they they really want to achieve and they come across the best best practices and they just feel like oh although i do have this idea but it's not the best practice so they come back how do you how do you tell people not to be influenced by it and yeah. do what their heart or intuition or their decision making is telling them to do right so you can't not be influenced by it, right? It's like, if you're a fish, you're going to be influenced by the currents. But I think it's important to recognize the currents and in the moment you need to escape them and see them for what they are. Um, just because everybody does it that way doesn't mean it's the right way. Just because someone says this is the best practice doesn't mean that's true. And I think that's even more dangerous to accept it all as truth in a world where basically having an internet connection, especially in the business world, seems to make somebody an expert, right? It's like you haven't actually done it, but you're good at sounding good on Twitter. So I'll obey what you say. And so we get a lot of group think. So I don't think you can avoid being influenced by best practices. But I do think what we can do, like I said before, is get better at pressure testing them. But to do that, we really have to understand what we're all about. And this works on the individual level and it works on the team level. And so if I'm going to write a book about questioning best practices, I can't say, and here's the best practice for questioning best practices. It's a little antithetical. So in the book, what I tried to do was articulate different types of questions we can ask to understand our own unique situations and use that as a decision-making filter. Um, I give us six questions, but hopefully I, I construct the argument in a way you can come up with your own. One of the questions I love is what is my aspirational anchor? So oftentimes we set goals. Goals are like grow the blog 50%. That's actually a measure of a goal. It's a metric, right? Get the job. We talk about results when we talk about goals, but that's a byproduct or a way to measure actual goals. Actual goals sound a lot more like the change you'd like to make. And I like to term them aspirational anchors. An example from Mike Brown and Death Wish Coffee. As soon as he said to himself, I want to create the world's strongest coffee, right away he began to make better choices because he knew what he was trying to achieve. He knew the change he had to make. He knew that actually, in, even though the purists would reject this idea, roasting Robusta coffee makes more sense because of the caffeine content, because of my aspiration. And so often we don't have that. Um, you can come up with shorthands, like my shorthand for my aspirational anchor is I'd like to be the Anthony Bourdain of the business world. 
I already mentioned Bourdain twice on this show. I mean, I'd like to tell stories that pull out meaning from people seemingly day to day in the workplace in the way Bourdain did in travel, food, and culture. So now that I have that little handle, I can make choices. Like, should I do this tactic or that tactic? Well, what serves the aspiration? Uh, and so if you're thinking about how do I actually like escape a best practice, it starts by understanding what you're all about, or if you work on a team, what your team's all about. And the first variable to understand is you, is you. So what is your aspirational anchor? Look for two different things. Your intent for the future, some kind of status you'd like to exist or thing you'd like to be doing. And then more importantly, some kind of hunger you have today, some dissatisfaction. And another really great example comes from the dictionary brand of all things, Merriam-Webster. Merriam-Webster years ago was super bland in their marketing, and now they're wonderful. They have an awesome tone of voice. Their former chief digital media officer named Lisa Schneider, she saw how boring they used to be, and she said to her team, let's show the world how fun and relevant we are. Great aspirational anchor, great goal, because it combines their intent for the future. We want to be part of the conversation, of course, and the hunger or dissatisfaction with their work in that moment. We're too bland, they're too predictable, we're too boring. So let's show the world how fun and relevant we are. So there's little things like that that we can do, asking questions and coming up with these concepts like the aspirational anchor that give us a picture of this nebulous idea of our context. And then we can use that stuff to take any best practice or idea and vet it against what we know to be true about our situations. What are other, other five questions, if you can give? Sure, um, so the first thing you're vetting is you. You're the biggest variable in your context. So first, what is your aspirational anchor? Let's take Lisa and her team over at Merriam-Webster. Let's show the world how fun and relevant we are. The second question you need to do to follow up and pressure test that is, why you? How are you uniquely situated? What is our unfair advantage? I think that's, that's actually what I said in the book. What is your unfair advantage for reaching your aspirational anchor? For Lisa and her team, the team there is incredibly witty. They're very, very smart people and their tone of voice is just so incredible. And Lisa saw that in their conversations internally, but externally they were boring and they automated all their social media. It was, it was terrible. There was a disconnect. So let's show the world how fun and relevant we are. What is your aspirational anchor? And then what is your unfair advantage for reaching it? For Lisa and her team, it's the fact that they had this tone of voice and it wasn't being used. So those are the first two questions for you. Then you turn your attention to your audience. What is your first principle insight? Have you asked why enough with Mike Brown? Stronger coffee, why, 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 why? Oh, they wanna live a hard charging life before they die. That's what they're after, the ability to work themselves to death. Okay, so we're gonna sell that, it's death wish coffee. So he reached a first principle insight. But to judge whether or not he'd actually done so, the second question about your audience, who are your true believers? Have you found a small number of people who react in a big way to what you're bringing into the world? And that derails our hunts for insights. Because we think, okay, maybe that's actually what they want. They want to charge hard after this life. But then we try to say, but, but a million people didn't like it. Well, that's not what you're looking for. To understand if you've reached first principles about your audience, you just want a small number of people reacting in a big way as a sign you're on the right path. And there's all these other concepts similar to that. Kevin Kelly, the founder of Wired Magazine, A Thousand True Fans is his concept. Seth Godin, smallest viable audience. You want the passionate super fans as a way to say, we don't have reach. We don't have a big movement yet, but because I'm pushing up against this specific insight about my audience that I'd like to serve, and I'm addressing it in my work for them, I have this small number of people where, yes, it's not a big reach number, but the resonance is there. It's deep. So the second variable of your context is your audience. You have to ask, what's my first principle insight about what they're after? And then who are my true believers? Have you found a small number of people reacting in a big way? And then finally, you move on to your resources. So what are my constraints? is the first question you should ask. Every study about creativity shows the same thing. You want constraints. We fight them because we don't like the ones we have or we don't know they're there and we bump up to an invisible wall in our work and our boss is like, nope, just kidding, you can't do that. But what are our constraints? You actually become more creative when you know your constraints and embrace them and operate inside the box. So don't think outside the box. Sometimes you just need a different box, but you always need the walls to be clear. And then once you ask that question and answer it, what are my constraints? this timeline, this budget, this team, et cetera, then how can we expand? That's the final question. Not from the box to the open field, but from one constrained test to another over and over again as you test and iterate your way forward. And so again, those are the six questions I propose in the book, but more importantly, I hope I equip people to ask their own questions to actually understand their unique situation and make better decisions accordingly. So you have to be in, intrinsically motivated to start. 
not just to start the your motivation should not die right totally yeah and completely and on that topic also you've written quite a lot how to start in a way to make people stay for longer as long as you want them right. in any product launch or in i think this was in reference to podcast i believe uh, that you have written but tell, tell us more about it how do you craft your start in order to keep the maximum retention i think the first thing is to really embrace what this work is about yeah. everyone thinks it's about grabbing attention it's not it's about holding it you know it's not about who arrives it's about who stays mm. and from a technical standpoint it's very easy to measure who arrives or how many so you get really excited about downloads for your podcast or views for your video but isn't it far more valuable to have 100 people who consume everything you do and tell their friends than 1000 people who are like passers by you know they saw it they don't remember it they don't subscribe they don't come back they don't tell anyone it's a lot easier to measure the passers by you know we even have a word for it on the internet traffic right traffic leaves traffic dissipates so you want to move traffic to an audience you know an audience the chairs are facing you and you're talking to them or maybe better you want to move it to a community which is where all the chairs are facing each other so it's not just a to b it's b to a and b to j and j to k so these are the ideas that i think inform a lot of the work i like doing where yes it's it's hard to get some people to look your way but looking your way or awareness in marketing terms it's not the goal affinity is the goal doing things people actually enjoy love things that earn trust and love over time because mm -hmm. that's the job and so we're far better getting lots of or some people rather the right people into our corner all the way than having a lot more people just glance at us because that's what everyone's in the business of doing is like we're kind of creating these car crashes like we're just getting people to look our way and it's all they can do to just sort of like tune it out and and find the thing or the person or organization where they're like you're speaking to my soul so i don't care about the rest of that stuff you might say the number one podcast in this category is that show i don't care because my favorite show is that one because i have this personal connection to it they're speaking to my soul it's this irrational choice so that's what our business is all about when we create anything we want to be their favorite thing and that doesn't mean objectively or academically the biggest or the best it means their personal preferred pick for a specific purpose. So all of our roles as makers and builders of anything is to make their favorite things. So if you start there and make that the goal, then the stuff we agonize over tends to come, like how many people watch, listen, download, subscribe, or buy, like the people you partner with and the employees. If you just focus on that little simple truth of being their favorite, now a lot of things tend to line up that everyone else is agonizing over to start, but it's not actually the starting point. Yeah, that's so true. And uh, it's, it, I think the, both of the things are important, like having a good start. Like I, I was interviewing Brendan Kane, who wrote this book about 1 million followers in one month. Uh, he has done that in another book he has written about Hookpoint, which is all about how to hook your audience. So that's the, how to create that first impression so that they click on whatever you've published online, right? So create that. So his focus is to create your hook point so attractive that you just can't avoid it. Great. Right. So here's the best hook in the world. Somebody you have a relationship with and trust says, you have to watch this YouTube series. Best hook in the world. Nothing I create mm. will supplant that. So I think what, you know, I think what we should do is focus on, you know, thinking of the marketing world. We talk about the marketing funnel and filling the top of the funnel with more awareness and more people, because at the bottom, some people trickle out as customers or fans. Think of it more like concentric circles where on the outside, you have total strangers passive observers, maybe uh, uh, some audience that's aware of you, then some audience that's active with you. And then in the, the middle, the bullseye, you have super fans. Mm. The job of modern creativity, marketing, what have you on behalf of your business is not to win over the total strangers. It's not to hook them quick and to grow quickly. Let your super fans go outbound to those total strangers because they'll have a better pitch than you ever will. And your job is to start at the inner rings and get people to be super fans and serve those super fans more deeply right? So resonance begets reach, but we're so obsessed with reach because it's the end result or the byproduct. It's the glitz and the glamour of it. It's the story of it that we've forgotten. Actually, it's a lot easier mm. to get a well-built rocket to fly than a dud missile, right? That sounds good, or we have a good coat of paint on it. So let's actually focus on the substance, right? Headlines are fine, but actually the paragraphs do the work. Your episodes are about the experiencing of the episodes. If you have a podcast, not the downloading, 
the experiencing and the, the memorability, the coming back to it, the referrals to your friends of it. These are things that are just human story-driven ideas. They don't sound like buy this app or use this tech and optimize for this channel and you'll spread and grow and you know, drive your business results ever higher. Mm. And so I don't know what it is that we get so enamored in the things that sound so clever and innovative and technical. And we've forgotten these very simple human truths. It's not about who arrives, it's about who stays. Yeah, but maybe it's because right now the, the, there is so much content, right? So if even if your content is very good, but if somebody doesn't even have a look at it, then it's, it's of no use. So because of that reason, I think it becomes so important to have kind of good start, like hook, the one we were talking about. Sure. In addition to have a great content, right? Just because we are like so much flooded with, if you look at YouTube, right? I don't know how many uh, billions of hours are uploaded every day. I don't know, it's in millions and billions. The number is really ridiculously high. Yeah, so I think it's, I, I think it's a balance of both. Although to get your true 1000 fans, as you mentioned, your content is the key. If you have Just, that. Yeah. I wonder though, is it inefficient and maybe even more expensive to go out to total strangers and try to get them to like you than it is to find the hundred people or 10, whatever feels small to you that is already in your network and build something that they can't wait to tell their friends about. I feel like it's not only easier to do it that way, but it's in a dollars and cents standpoint, it's more efficient to do it that way. And I think we get this false sense of security that we are already capable of making something for those people. But you know, I'll just stick with a podcast as an easy example because I've, I've done so many at this point that it's just always front of mind. If you can't get 10 people in your professional network to listen to your business podcast for 40 minutes a week and then go tell 10 more, what makes you think you can go out to total strangers who have no context on you, no relationship on you and get them to listen and love it and subscribe? I, I think that's backwards, right? So I, I don't have the data that I can say this is the better way to do it, but it just feels, again, intuitive, back to intuition that it's a lot easier to start with folks that are pretty interested in you already. And we are, all of us have a few of those people and give them something they can't wait to come back to and share um, than it is to try and go out to the masses, which sounds appealing because there's more of them and get them to enter our world. So I would just ask people to just think, sit with that thought for a while. You know, there's a lot of advice around going out to the masses. There's not, there's not too many people here who are like, I'm just gonna go out to the people that already like me and give them a gift. And if they're not excited about the gift, I should know, I should probably kill the initiative or change it or improve it. So I would just encourage people to think through that. I would agree with you because that's, that's how things go viral. Going, going viral is the internet equivalent of a one hit wonder, right? Like the actual spike that decline, what makes it a spike is that it goes up fast and down fast. So what you actually wanna do is arc the entire curve in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're enamored with the spikes. I think what we should be actually examining is the valleys, right? Don't look at the peak, look at the valley. Because if you're not building a strong base all the time of audience that loves you, of customers that buy from you and trust you, of clients that can't wait to work with you again, if you don't have that steady foundation, it doesn't matter how big you build the house, it's going to crumble. So yes, please, can you tell us about a sort of framework that you have on your website on how to create a start so that you get the maximum retention? Right. So the, you know, I mentioned be their favorite, keep that in mind. That's the goal, being relevant and being enjoyable, totally table stakes in a world full of too much relevant and too much enjoyable stuff. Um, so you want to feel personal. You want to be their favorite. How do you do that? Well, it's a process. It's a journey to get there. And when we start projects today, we tend to latch onto the wrong first challenges, like what microphone should I buy for the podcast or what automation technology for my email list or, you know, on and on and on. Um, another, another popular question. You do podcasts, right? You understand podcasts, Jay. Should, I'm going to start a podcast. Should I also put it on YouTube? It's like you're starting in the wrong place. The best place to start is the first challenge you'll face when making anything that you want to be their favorite thing. Say something that matters. It sounds so breathtakingly obvious, and yet so many people don't do that. In the world of podcasts, for example, there's so many people creating generic talk shows with any expert. It doesn't matter. They don't have a premise. So a premise is what you develop when you're developing a consistent project, newsletter, podcast, video show, a blog series, the premise of your book. What is the premise? I don't just mean the topics because that's where people stop. The topics, plus like you said, the hook. You actually do need some kind of unique angle, right? Is it a gimmick? You're gonna make it playful and gamified when you explore these topics? That's what Three Clips kind of has as a gimmick, right? We're gonna explore podcasts. Lots of shows explore podcasts, but only our show uses this consistent gimmick. Uh, is it a quest? 
It's a bit, a bit grander than a gimmick. We want to change the way people view this thing. We want to understand this topic. We don't understand it now. Join us on the journey, this quest to understand it. So topics plus the hook, what you explore plus how you explore it, combining that into this pithy, powerful premise for whatever the project is. That's how you say something that matters. And when you have a premise, you do something pretty magical for the growth of your thing. So back to us talking about results and audience and the retention of that audience, the premise is what provides motivation to subscribe where people throw up their hands and they're like, yes, thank you. That is so for me. I can't wait to subscribe. Also, I want to bring my friends with me and my contacts with me. I want others on this journey with me too. So we skipped that step. And I started to package this when I started teaching podcasters last year, uh, show development. And that's the first in what I'd call the showrunner's circle. But you can do this in any project, not just the show. Say something that matters. That's the premise. It provides motivation to subscribe. Then get them to the end. Inside the thing people have opted into from you, have you structured it in such a way people want to stick with it? Have you learned storytelling techniques like the use of tension or open loops? Is it a hero's journey type story? Have you adapted an actual framework into the interview? Do you have segments? How do you format your experience in such a way that you get them to the end? That provides motivation to stay. Then you have to move to a new section of the circle, the bottom half, where you really get deep with the audience deep in audience relationships. That's where you let your personality shine. The quirks, the transparency, the vulnerability, the tone of voice, who you are comes through more forcefully. And fourth and finally, reinvent the experience because stagnation kills all creativity, all projects that run consistently. You have to find little wrinkles to inject into the show. Mm. A new segment here, a new way of introducing somebody, new themes for each season of your show, uh, You know, insert the different cold open for your newsletter or what have you. So say something that matters, get them to the end, deepen your relationships and reinvent the experience and the cycle continues. And if you focus on those four things in the right order, now all of a sudden this flywheel starts where people are super excited about what you're saying, stick with it till the end, get really deep with you and feel connected to you and take action on your behalf. And here's the retention part. They don't get bored with it because you're always reinventing and always exploring. That, that makes a lot of sense. And it looks like very useful five, six steps. <laughs> Make note of them and see if I can use them. Uh, in my my shows, definitely. And look, I'm making this all sound mm. pithy because it's like a visual I'm picturing in my head and teaching my my course. And but if I'm here to say question best practices, like everything I'm saying, they're just possibilities. They're just starting points. Yeah. Like there's nothing that we build that's special or extraordinary that has been best practiced to death. Like no one's best practiced their way towards something exceptional. So I would just like everyone here to have like there's like a think for yourself clause underneath my face here, right? Let's, these are starting points. These are possibilities. Find ways to do it in ways that feel authentic to you and your situation. Thank you for sharing that, Jay. And it's, it's going to be really useful. And I can think of many more questions, but in the interest of time, I'll ask you, maybe we'll have more interviews in future on some drilling down on one particular topic. Sure. Uh, the one question that I ask all my guests, which is uh, what according to you are the top three skills that everybody needs in order to be happy and successful and fulfilled, but schools are not teaching. Um, I was the poster child for this. Is, is, is the fear of not having the right answer? And this goes back to my book, right? The fear of not having the right answer. We're not told how truly to problem solve when there actually is no individual correct answer. You can't really test your way forward. Um, you can't say, yes, you got it correct. We need to learn how to, how to wade into the gray areas and understand nuance. Mm. So that's one thing. Um, I would also say that we aren't teaching empathy enough. We're not understanding how to get into someone else's shoes. And, and we're getting so polarized in general, um, thanks to, in large part, the algorithms that we play on, the bubbles that we're in information-wise, that um, you know, I'm, I'm shocked by the people I know who are academically brilliant, who are professionally successful, who refuse to say to themselves, I might not agree with you, but I'd like to understand you. Because either I can then change your mind or at least combat the evils you're doing in the world, or see that you're not just 100% this monolithic evil or one way. So I think we need to be teaching empathy. And if I can be very specific in one way, I think the third thing might be um, just personal finance, just how to be an adult and run your life successfully. Why in God's name did I learn calculus and trigonometry? Like here comes another year where I'm not going to use any of that. And I get it. Some fields you do. Great. Learn it as a graduate level or undergrad course. Why did I learn it in high school instead of how to balance my checkbook, how to get a job, how to interview, how to handle my own business and run my career and my personal finances? What are we doing? So that's a very specific focused one. That's a pet rock of mine. 
when I when I started thinking about this this question, right? Three things. I never thought anybody would talk about finances. And I can't tell you this is one of the top from I've spoken to 35, 36 different people now. And many of them have told that, you know, students should be taught finances and accounting and how to manage your money, et cetera. <laughs> it was a surprise to me, but yeah. I, I'm I'm incredibly lucky. Mm. I was born in the northeast of the US in the 80s to a, two loving parents who are still together, white, straight, male, uh, upper middle class family. I had the door slightly open for me. And my hard work was to push through that door mm. with everything I have. I'm still pushing today. Some people are born and they have a lock on that door or seven locks and a guard dog and chain link fence in front of them. Like we're not all, we don't start in the same place. So I have my parents and I can say to them, I did quite often, I'm 24 living on my own for the first time. Here's an obvious question you figured out. And they'd be like, here's an obvious answer. Well, I know school needs to adapt beyond question answer. Like there's already bad bottled up in education because all we're doing is teaching things with the correct answer. But personal finance and that kind of stuff, it feels like it's perfectly suited for the existing education system because there are some answers, mm. right? So my parents were able to give them to me. Not everyone's so lucky, right? Also, I shouldn't have maybe learned it at 24, but 18. So I, I do think it's, it makes total sense. I don't know what we're doing. So now that you have written a book, you have a, you kind of podcast ex expert now and you're a sought after speaker. What next? Let's say, <laughs> let's say this is going to be a bit of kind of interview question. Where can I see J in five years time? I love that question. Um, I don't think I've ever actually been asked that question before, which as an interviewer, I, I always appreciate. I, the more I do this work, the more I realize that there's two types of content. There's uh, an analogy from a blog post that someone sent me from early internet when blogging was just wonderful and it was a thing and it wasn't over corporatized. It was someone's like basically diary about writing. And this author said, there's two types of content. They used a financial analogy, stock, and flow. So flow is like your social media content, jumping on new trends, your, you know, kind of daily drip by drip stuff. And then there's stock. And that's the stuff that you, you know, the bigger bets that you invest now and you hold and you wait. I want to be doing more stock. I want to be doing things that you don't hear from me for five months. And then I release the next book, the next documentary, the next documentary series. I, I, I find myself in this wonderful position that I'm super grateful for, that I've made a lot of shows and I've published a lot of stuff and I've worked out these creative muscles and I want to add to my list of no's, my list of rejections. Like I, I need to start pushing again. You know, the pandemic caused me to settle. My speaking business came crashing down. I started doing online education and moving to digital products, courses, memberships, that kind of stuff. And I'm grateful for those things and I, I'm learning a lot and I, ho I hope they work. But on top of those, the reason I'm doing those is I just want to tell more ambitious stories that mean a lot to people in the workplace. Because when you look around the business world, you get two types of content, mostly. Business content that is about the trends and like the same five to 10 brands just talked about ad nauseum or career advice that's pretty vapid. And all of that sits on top of this like disgusting underlayer of the hucksters and the spammers trying to sell you their get rich quick schemes or even some well-meaning people that kind of do a flavor of that. Well, I want to push all that aside and bring into this world of business and work, which is so meaningful to so many of us, the types of stories that Bourdain told, the, the types of immersive human to human things that you can lose yourself in because they're so great to just witness and immerse yourself in, but also change you and help you in some ways. And so in five years, I hope that a, a larger percent of my work is me focused on those things, the bigger things, the more ambitious things, but most importantly, the things that actually make a difference. Because I think that's the one goal we all share, right? It's not to like drive leads, not to do this or that or get that job, it's to make stuff or build a career that makes a difference. And so that, that's what I wanna be doing in five years. I'm doing it in my own way now, I hope, but there's so much more I wanna try in the future and it all comes back to story. Thank you for sharing that and all the best. Sure, thanks. Right, so how can people reach you finally? Uh, the best place to reach me is just my website, jayconzo.com. Okay, great. So thank you, Jay. It was really interesting conversation with you. I just have to stop asking you questions. I do have a lot of questions. So <laughs> well, thanks, thanks for letting me just like explode and get on my soapbox and rant for a while. This is a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Uh, everyone, if you are looking to know more about how to craft your let's say podcast or your stage presence or how to be a storyteller and many more, 
check his website. So I'm going to put the links down there, jekulza.com, if you have not yet done so. And if you think that this interview has added some value to you, then please do consider subscribing to this channel. And don't forget to hit the bell icon so that you get notification to all my future videos. I will see you again next week with another amazing guest. And until then, you take care and keep learning.